All right, guys, welcome back to another video. This is going to be a response to Dean from Escape to Gaming. Uh, he's asked five questions. There's been a few tags like this going around lately, um, but the five questions that Dean has asked uh, interest me quite a lot, so I'm going to do a response to this. And if you haven't already checked his channel out, uh, go and have a look at his original video in the low bar and subscribe if you like what you see. So, five questions. The first one is, what percentage of retro versus modern gaming do you currently do? Um, there's a lot of debate over what the word retro means, you know, is it anything that's not current or, or, or is it something else? For the purpose of this question, I'm going to say retro is 16-bit generation and 2D feel, 16-bit generation style feel games, you know, mainly legitimately from back in the day. Um, because retro to me, it, it's, it's tied in with nostalgia, it's tied in with eliciting memories from a certain time in your life, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, retro to me is really 16-bit generation and uh, you know games that are like that as well, modern games that have that feel, that sort of thing. So, um, With that in mind, I'd say the vast majority, probably 90% if not more, of my gaming is modern gaming. Uh, I don't have any current systems, but I'm talking stuff like you know the 360, the Wii, the original Xbox. Those are all modern gaming to me. They're distinctly different to what I would... What I personally see as retro, um, so yeah, it's it's mainly it's pretty much all uh, modern gaming. Uh, but I'm really enjoying it though. Like currently, I'm playing Super Mario Galaxy. A uh, bit of a spoiler for the next pickup video, but absolutely loving this. The first time I've played through it, and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. So having a lot of fun on, you know, uh, sixth, fifth, se maybe seventh, if the Wii U seventh generation uh, consoles. Um, I don't play a lot of retro currently and that's mainly because and you'll know this if you've been a subscriber for a while but anybody who's not been around for a while uh, the reason I don't play retro currently is my setup is just not designed for it I don't have a CRT TV and uh, anyone you know who knows anything about retro gaming will know that uh, the older systems look like ass on modern TVs unless you get some kind of pretty expensive scanline generator that's another thing that i haven't yet done you know i haven't committed so i don't really know what i'm going to do in that aspect um am i going to get a crtv and try and squeeze it into the limited space that i have in the game room or am i going to pony up for a decent scanline generator so that i can get the best out of those old games because i just don't want to spoil the experience of playing these classics on a modern telly without any type of correct you know software correcting you know because they look terrible if you don't do that um so that's something i've str struggled with for a while um there's other uh reasons that i haven't been playing those games as well i'll get into that later in the video but uh yeah because my setup's just not designed for them currently i've been doing a lot of modern gaming um and but i don't feel like i'm missing out so you know i'm having a hell of a lot of fun on those on the more recent consoles, should we say, on the Wii and the original Xbox and the 360 as well, still play that a lot. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much all modern. Uh, what retro gaming that I do do uh, is on the DS. So a lot of games on there have that retro feel to it. You know, there's a lot of uh, 2D isometric uh, RPGs, uh, platformers, lots of games that have a retro feel to them, even obviously the system is more recent. Um, so that's really the only place I'm doing any kind of retro style gaming. Uh, in terms of genuine retro, it's very, very rarely that I do it the, at the minute. Again, because I'm just waiting to get that set up, uh, to settle on a decent setup that will do those games justice. Um, so, yeah, okay, number two. What is your favourite genre of games past and present? So my favourite genre, if you're going to use those that term, those terms... It's probably RPGs, um, because, the, well, the way that I want to answer this question, really, is kind of a cheat, I guess, but it doesn't really matter. I'm sure Dean won't care. Um, the thing that I look for in a game the most is a sense of adventure, you know, a sense of discovery, um, a freedom, a certain freedom to the feel of a game as well. Uh, and that's what really gets me excited about games. A sense of adventure, a sense of freedom... In what you can do and where you can go and uh, so that's what really gets me excited about games but, you know pretty much my favorite series of all time despite the name of this channel is Zelda uh, 
and that's a lot to do with the fact that yeah you have this sense of exploration of discovery uh, finding new places talking to people getting you know really getting immersed into this world that you feel like there's a, a lot of uh, potential um, and, and that's to do with the exploration aspect of it it's also a lot to do with the freedom of how you uh, explore you know the different tools that you can come across to navigate your surroundings the different toys that you get to play with all give it a real good sense of freedom in how you play and where you can go and this this kind of thing so that's the type of game that I really dig is games that have that sense of adventure and freedom um, which is I guess why RPGs is something that I really always liked because you get that a lot in those types of games um, back in the day you know I used to love platformers a lot um, they are less popular now um, they're, le they're less common rather um, yeah, and that's and that's a shame. It's a shame that there's less platformers these days. Uh, some that I could mention that I've enjoyed recently again: Mario, Super Mario Galaxy, immense, and uh, 3D World on the Wii U is brilliant. And this, there's actually quite a few decent platformers on the Wii U. Um, and Alice: Return to Madness is a brilliant uh, action platformer. Uh, I would put, I would describe that as. But yeah, but that's how I'd uh, answer that question. Um, number three, what are your biggest concerns or fears for gaming in the future? Um, well, an obvious one would be this move towards digital gaming. Now, I am conflicted about this, so I know that it's a complex issue and there are pros and cons on both sides of this uh, debate, so to speak, But uh, and I'll try and navigate them, but uh, I am conflicted on it. Um, digital gaming, if the future of gaming is completely digital, you lose control over your own collection. You're effectively just renting your collection. Now we've been. Everybody's probably heard, you know, these arguments. If you haven't, I'll just go through them very quickly. With digital gaming, you're relying on external factors for your game collection that you have spent money and time and invested emotion into. You're reliant to a certain extent on external factors, server support for the games. Uh, and it's, you know things like not just the games themselves but if there's any patches or updates that are needed in years to come when those games are forgotten about it might not be possible to get those games in their completed forms it might not be possible to get those games at all um, unless the companies decide to support them on servers and sell them possibly sell them again uh, you know further down the line but um, yeah you, so you lose control of your own collection there's something to be said about the physical format in the sense that, you know, not not only do you have control over what you actually own, but uh, the, the thrill of the chase, and I know this is kind of a romantic side of the argument, you know, being able to go to charity shops and thrift stores and, uh, and you know, car boot sales and uh, all these other things, to find bargains, to find deals, to really go on the hunt, that is a fun aspect of game collecting. Um, and that is lost with digital gaming. Uh, you know, the companies have full control over what they charge for these games. You can't go looking for deals. You can't go looking for bargains. Those games are those prices for as long as those companies decide they are. Maybe they'll have sales on here and there. Maybe eventually the, sale, the, the prices will go down. But, you know, and especially in the future, if it does go fully digital, they will have even less incentive to reduce the price of those games you know because uh, as it is currently after a game's been out a certain amount of time it will go down in price second hand games will appear people will be able to get those games a lot cheaper which possibly will drive down the price of those games online as well now currently of course digital games are released uh, usually around the same price as a physical release you'd think that's really out of order because of course there's a lot less money goes into digital games than a physical copy you obviously got the transportation the production all the people's wages associated with that process those processes rather um, it's a lot cheaper to distribute <laughs> distribute uh, digital games so they really should be a lot cheaper and yet on the other side of that debate I understand why those games aren't massively cheaper than the physical releases uh, and it's because if digital games undercut physical releases it would be bad for the economy in terms of it would uh, it would undercut those stores you know those people's jobs would be at risk then and uh, that's not a good situation um, so it's a tough one it's, it's a it's it's we shall see how it goes 
I hope that the gaming community doesn't end up supporting a fully digital future. But who knows, who knows. I mean, PC gaming is already mainly digital. So there's a whole huge portion of the gaming market there that's already not too bothered about a digital gaming future. Um, but yeah, on consoles, if that even remains to be a thing, it's it's less clear what how that will turn out. Um, so that, yeah, there's going to be some big changes in gaming. Let's see how it goes. In terms of digital, I'm conflicted though, like I said. Um, I know that economically and ethically, I should support digital gaming. You know, uh, sorry, not economically, environmentally. Environmentally and ethically, I should support digital gaming. Because, you know, obviously the oil that goes into making the boxes and the discs, all the plastic that is made with the oil could potentially be coming from dodgy sources. I mean, everybody knows that the horrendous wars that have been fought in the Middle East over the last few decades over oil. You know, terrible, terrible things have occurred. Um, this rampant imperialism has been driven by a thirst for mineral wealth and oil being the main uh, culprit. So, who knows where the oil for the plastic that makes up the games that we have on our shelves comes from. It's possible it comes from some of these uh, conflicts that are really just indefensible ethically. And also environmentally, you know, if you're not using all those those plastics and burning all those, uh, producing all those materials and that waste and all the rest of it, again, I should be pro-digital, but it's hard to let go of. It's hard to let go of the control of your own collection and it's just not as it's just not as romantic it's not as fun to be to have, you know it, there's no fun just go, go any game you want digital online type in the name there it is i'll have it Shh, i've got it where's the fun in that there's no fun but i know that in terms of the actual game in itself digital's good because it opens up you know um the potential for those games to be discovered and played by a lot more people they're more widely available. So purely from a gaming perspective, again, I should support digital gaming. Um, but I, I'm finding it difficult to. I am finding it difficult. Uh, we shall see how that goes. Um, another concern that I guess that I have is a concern of the present as well as the future is this uh, tendency for more and more remakes and HD remasters. Now, the only argument that I kind of give any credence to in support of those things is that it gives new gamers a chance to experience these older games. You know, new generation, or even just same generation that just never got around to those original releases, can now play a better version. And so yeah, it makes these classics more widely available, and in some cases it makes them better. Uh, but it doesn't always make them, make them better, it doesn't always. I mean, some of these HD releases are just fixing resolution issues, they're not really doing a lot to upgrade the game's actual graphics in terms of the textures. Um, I recently played uh, the Beyond Good and Evil HD version and to me actually the old version looks better because with the new version again it's just improved the resolution but that really shows up some of the age of the game. You know the polygons look really simple and uh, some of the details just not acceptable by, not acceptable by today's standards. So they don't always make a game look better. I think the old version, personally speaking, the old version of Beyond Good and Evil looks better. But then you've got games like Twilight Princess. Now, there does look to have been a bit more effort going to that version of the game. But it was released at full price. Now, to me, that's unacceptable for a couple of reasons. First of all, Twilight Princess has already made its money back in the day. Um several times over it's made its money already you know and and that game you know, whilst it's an amazing game of course it can be accessed by anyone already anyway so this you know the, the argument that uh, re-releases give a new audience chance to experience old games isn't watertight because in most of the cases you can go and download an iso of these older games and play the original versions for free anyway. All you need is five minutes figuring out how to get an emulator working and download a ROM, an ISO, or whatever, and you can play the original versions for free quite easily. So they are already available, but you know, you get a chance to have a, a better looking game. They don't put a game development's worth of effort 
into making those games look a little bit better. And that's why, to me, it's indefensible that they're released full price. Twilight Princess being a full price game, it's, it's not on. I, I do want it because I would like to play that game again and I may as well play it with this upgraded version, but I'm not going to be paying anywhere near retail price for it. If I never manage to find it cheap, so be it. But, um, so yeah, this is just happening a little bit too often for me now. And I just worry that are these games, are these re-releases, these remasters, are they being put out there in lieu of effort being put into new IPs and, you know, development studio has been given license to go and make something new. Uh, new ideas, new stories, new game mechanics. You know, we've got all this power of these new consoles and we're just seeing a hell of a lot of remasters of old games that are, you know, outdated not just by the graphics, but by the game mechanics as well. You know, so, yeah, HD remasters can't fix or, or can't modernise uh, all these games uh, in, in, in every sense. Um, this obviously some brilliant new IPs, some brilliant new games coming out as well. I just worry that it's happening a little bit too often. We're getting these uh, HD remasters, and you're getting remasters of, of games that aren't even that old. I mean, stuff that came out in the previous generation. We did see that a little bit in the last generation as well. There's some crossover titles that were on the original Xbox as well as the 360, but it's just happening a hell of a lot more often now. Uh, so that's a worry. I just I would like to see more new IPs, more new adventures. More, more new invention rather and more effort put into uh, to utilize all this processing power to make more uh, uh, evolved gaming experiences anyway number four what where do you see your gaming collection in five years or more right well it's very possible that my Dreamcast collection will be gone by then uh, it's a small collection it doesn't hold a massive amount of nostalgia for me, apart from obviously Shenmue. Um, I never really collected for this system. I used to get burned discs, so it doesn't have a massive amount of nostalgia for me. But there's some brilliant exclusives on there, and uh, that's what my small collection is based around. Um, but after I've played all those, I can see myself getting rid of the Dreamcast collection, apart from Shenmue, which I will always obviously keep. Um, it's very replayable, in my opinion. Um, I, I can also see myself getting rid of the N64 collection. When I first started this channel several years ago, I was collecting Mega Drive and N64, and I went for a complete in-box, pretty decent nick uh, for the N64, And but that small collection it has been kind of uh, uh, made uh, redundant because I now have an EverDrive for the N64 with every single game ever released on one SD card, and that's just permanently in the N64 that I've got hooked up. So the collection that I've got is redundant and the only reason I'm really holding on to it now is to have this one I wonder whether uh, that console will see a spike in, in, in value of the games uh, and I don't need to get rid of them right now I'm not massively skint so um, you know I haven't had to sell them so I've kept them thinking it'd be better to sell them further down the line if they go up uh, in value and maybe I'll do that or maybe I won't maybe I'll hold on to them for a long long time and then end up uh, handing them down to my nephew if he becomes uh, a gamer might be a cool thing to hand down um, so but personally speaking if, if I don't do that I can see myself getting rid of the N64 collection and the Dreamcast collection and possibly the Saturn collection as well these are all these are three systems that I have a small collection for of each console but um, you know filled with a bunch of games that I definitely want to try and I think the majority of those games are exclusives for the respective systems uh, but once I've played through them probably get rid uh, and then I'll have more space on my shelves for the original Xbox yeah uh, that's that's not a high priority but uh, yeah so I can see that happening I can also see my DS collection disappearing as well that's slowly been whittled down um, mainly because uh, I'm just using ISOs I use an, an R4 card for DS now and it's just more convenient to have them all in one or two little things instead of a whole bag full of you know cards that I used to carry around. Um, so I can see that, uh, yeah, I can see that happening. Right, number five, what are you looking forward to the most with game development in the future? Now for me, this comes down to virtual reality. 
I absolutely love VR. I played on the DK2 Oculus Rift uh, years ago. Um, this is when it had the lower resolution and it also had um, uh, no tracking movement, no positional tracking. Uh, but even then, I could tell that it was a really awesome gaming experience. Uh, so I'm really excited to try the, the proper consumer version of the Rift and the HTC Vive as well. I want to try that as well. Um, but I think that VR could really push game development in a way that we haven't really seen since the advent, advent of polygon gaming. When 3D gaming really kicked off and blew up, it introduced a whole new set of challenges and uh, things to be mindful of. You know, you had to be aware of your camera. You had to be aware of, uh, you know, uh, the, the free exploration that you were giving to players. There were new challenges and new restrictions and, uh, and new bars that had to be met when Polygon Gaming really kicked off. And, you know, that faltered for the first generation. We really saw that... Uh, coming to its own on the sixth generation, the original, original Xbox PS2, was the second generation of consoles that used 3D. But I think that VR is going to push game development in a similar way. And it's because when you're developing games on VR, you have to be really aware of certain things. Uh, immersion is one. Uh, frame rate and smoothness of graphics is another. You can't have anything in VR that uh, breaks the immersion. Anything that... Uh, takes you out of that experience anything that reminds you that you're in a game uh, so yeah so choppy frame rates they just cannot be allowed in VR it fucks you up it, not only does it mess the game experience up it literally makes you feel ill uh, to have anything in VR that messes with that perception of, of immersion so yeah it's not necessarily first person stuff uh, but in terms of the graphics you need a high frame rate you need a smooth you know frame rate um, yeah, and and things like that. In terms of uh, the gameplay, uh, the, you really there's there's certain um, industry standards that I think will become apparent through VR, and I think that this will be good for gaming in general because I think if VR takes off, if it becomes popular enough, you might see a lot of kind of dual releases. And what I mean by that is you'll have a game come out that you can play it on a screen uh, in a traditional sense, or you can play it in VR. It'd be as easy as just putting VR mode on and playing the game on your headset instead of on the telly. I don't think there'll be too much problem with doing that um, because we've already seen in the indie market, in the indie scene rather, um, people modding traditional games to run on uh, VR headsets. So people have got Skyrim running on an Oculus Rift. Ah, oh, amazing! I mean, you know, it doesn't have stereoscopic as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure. You know, when they do that conversion, it doesn't have stereoscopic 3D, obviously, because you've still only got one image. You're just duplicating it and putting it on and mapping the um, movement of the headset to, you know, the camera's movement or whatever. But it's, it seemed like it's been a pretty simple procedure to get traditional games running good enough on VR. So if they were literally doing that, you know, as part of the game's development, I don't think it would be too difficult to have that to have those dual, that dual capability. And with that in mind, you're gonna see a lot of games that, yeah, have, have, are, are very aware of uh, aspects to do with immersion in a game, because when you're doing it, programming for VR, you can't break that immersion. Uh, it makes you feel ill. Not only does it spoil the experience, it makes you feel ill. So there's certain aspects of VR that are gonna push game development in a way that will be good for everyone. Um, this is the first generation, so at the minute, of course, uh, you know, not every game is being developed uh, in, in ways that are going to fully realise those, those challenges uh, and restrictions and stuff. But I think in general, VR could have the potential to really kickstart um, another, uh, you know, era of, uh, of improvement in game development. Um, because, you know, for all the computing power, for all the processing power that we've got, are we seeing a huge increase in the depth of game experiences? Maybe we are. Again, I've not, I haven't even got, you know, the new consoles. So I'm not talking from a point of experience here at all. Um, really not. So anyone who's had those consoles, can you tell me, you know, on the new consoles, are you really seeing an extra depth to game experiences or is it just prettier versions of genres that we're familiar with? Is it just prettier first-person shooters and RPGs 
and races and fighters, you know, or are those games genuine? Do those games genuinely feel more immersive, more involved, more um, complex? Because I'm not seeing it really, not to a great extent. I don't know. I, I could be talking up to bullshit on that point, but I, I, yeah. But getting back to the point, I think VR will push game development in really positive ways, and that's what I see. I'm going to stop now because I don't want this video to go over half an hour. Because then I'll have to do two videos. That'll be right bollock. All right, in a bit.